say one day, when he comes back, that day we see him, we're going to be able to understand and know all the things that we think that we've missed, that we are going to realize at that point we've not missed a thing, church. We're going to realize when he comes back and he stands there before us, as he calls us up to meet him in the air, that we've really not missed out on anything that this world has to offer. And if you look around the world, it's, it's, it's showing all of these things that how good it is, how great it is. You have to be here. You have to be there. You need to do this. You need to do that. But you know what? They're, they're teaching us that we don't need God. They're teaching us that there's more out there than God. They're teaching. I even heard this one. There was a, there was a guy talking. I don't remember who he was or what he was. I think it's something to do with the World Economic Forum, how they were getting ready to start controlling some things. <laughs> it's not like that God up there does some God thing in the cloud. You know, I'm going to tell you something. There's, there's a little more to it than just being in the cloud. You see, that God that he's clowning and playing about is the God that created those clouds. Right. Those clouds are the dust of his feet as he's going about to and fro to do what it is he needs to do. One day, they're going to realize that the things that they're wanting to make fun of you know what? Let me ask something. I'm just something I've always been curious about. If these people want to claim there is no God, why are they working so hard to put themselves in a position of a God? It does not make sense. It is a complete contradiction to everything that there is going on out there in my, my mind and the way they've got it set up and the way it's designed. I'm going to tell you, my mom used to tell us all the time, it's nothing but fodder for the fire. They're building it to burn. She said, leave them alone. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> leave them alone. Let them go on. It's fodder for the fire. Basically, what she's telling the church, she says, you better not get too close. If you're too close, when it sets fire, you're going to get burnt. Yeah. Don't let it draw too much into your attention. Church, I'm going to tell you, I'm really glad to be here. I thank you for the opportunity to stand, it's, it, even as much as uh, trying to tag Dustin in. He, before I can even get back in, tag me back. So no. <laughs> <laughs> but I do appreciate the opportunity to stand. Where we're going to be, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles, chapter seven, and it is it's, it's familiar scripture. It's, it's going to be very familiar scripture, church. But I believe right now, I would like if I can bring it and show it to you the way God has showed it to me. He's really dealt with my heart over this scripture for some time now. And there's a lot of times that when you're studying out something, as you know, it will just give you that thought. And then you'll kind of go sleep right there. You're like, okay, well, we can't do that. What do you want to do with it? You want to do a while. <laughs> and if you can bring it back, and it's uh, be in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. If you would stand with me in reference to the reading of the word. Starting in verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. As for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked and to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shall observe my statutes and my judgments. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you this evening, Lord, we ask that you bring that you, that you be here with us in this place. Lord, we ask that you just touch each and every one of our hearts. Lord, I ask that you calm my nerves. I ask, Lord, that you just hide me, Lord, behind the cross. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you just take away all this flesh and just take over whatever it is that you would have need of in this place this night. Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing, but through you, all things are possible. Lord, I want to be an encouragement to your people. Lord, I want to give them something that they can put in their heart as it takes away that you've spoken through me that will give them that encouragement. Lord, change the outlook that it's not just doom and gloom. Lord, that things are looking up. Things are going to get brighter. The joy cometh in the morning. Lord, I just ask you to have your perfect will and way. If there be anything to be hindered to the movement of your spirit in this place tonight, 
as you bind it up in the name of Jesus and remove it from here, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And we'll be sure to give you the praise, honor, and glory for this in all things. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Where are we here? Where are we are right here? If you back up the verse in chapter 6 in this second Chronicles, it's a prayer. When we go back in the verse 5, it's where after the ark has been placed in the temple, then that whole chapter 6 just about is Solomon praying. And if you really want to know where we are as, as Christians and how we worship and how we pray, I'll challenge you to start reading your Bible when he starts praying. Hold your hands up. Pray at your normal pace and see if you can keep on there until you get to the end of that prayer. I'm going to tell you, when it, it, it requires some physical strength. It has required physical strength, but where we have gotten to as a people and where we have gotten to in our worship, we don't want to put forth that type of effort. We don't want, we, and it's just, let me back up, it's not that we don't want to. We have just gotten accustomed to not needing to or having to. It's just that if we've gotten into the custom that that's not how it's done anymore. And we've gotten into the custom, it's not that it's wrong. It's not that it's out of line. It's just not how, it's not the way that it's done. It's not the order of service. And where's Solomon? Solomon has just completed building the temple. And where he is is there's a ceremony. All the people have been coming to, to dedicate it. And it's um, and, and, and if you go back and look, God has told him. <coughs> I believe it's in verse 12. Well, he was, God has told him that he served his prayer. Solomon gets finished praying and he comes to him tonight and he tells him that I've heard your prayer. There he goes. And the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer. How good is the church when God tells us, Brother Mike, I heard your prayer. And you know what I'm saying? That ain't going to mean nothing else to us. Thus, when he says, I've heard you, brother, that don't mean nothing. That may not mean nothing to me. But I'm going to tell you something. If you come through a desert, You've come through a dry spell and you've been down on your knees and in your secret place praying. When he comes back and he says, Bruce, I heard you. Hey. Bruce, I know I heard you. Yeah. Don't get discouraged, Bruce. Don't look down, look up. I heard you. Solomon had to take, you know, I got to think, this is just why I run this rabbit. You know everything Solomon had as a king was given to him? You think about that. He was, he was the there was never a king like it. There's never been one since. Yeah. Everything he had was given to him. You tell me God can't work. You tell me God can't make a, make a payment. He can't make ends meet. He set Solomon up in a manner that we can only even we can't even wrap our head around. It. He said he made the silver as the, the silver was like stones on the ground. But he also gave the people some instructions that they were to be using as a reminder. Because what it was is he knew, God knew that we're human. God knew that we were flesh. And one thing, and I don't know, I hope you guys looked at this better than I did, but for the longest time when I would hear that scripture, I'm thinking, okay, we've done something wrong. Something has transpired. We've been bad. We're in a hole. We're in a strait. It's kind of like when Pastor Brian says, oh, Lord, if you'll just let me get out of this, I'll never do it again. But that wasn't one of those prayers, church. He had just dedicated the temple. Everything was fine. And probably, if, if you go back in history, Brother Mike, it's probably one of the best times for the church and for God's people that there had ever been. But what he was doing, Dustin, he said, this is simply a reminder. You see how good it is right now. If it ever happens that you find yourself in a strait, if it ever happens that you find yourself in a bad spot and you're not sure what's going on or what's happening, all you got to do is just, hey, hey wait, just seek my face. Just slow down a little bit. Don't forget where you come from, church. Don't forget that the devil is alive. Don't forget that everything that Satan is throwing at us is to try to get us distracted from what God would have for us. He told Solomon what he was going to do, and then he showed him what he expected of the people as a response to this trial. Now, with the help of God for a little while, I want to point out three things that's very, very important in my eyes. In terms of this scripture, there's three things. <coughs> that I think that is, that is very critical. And what I want to do is I want to take it from, a, as we're going through this thing and through these scriptures, I want you to listen to what I'm saying in the physical sense of that 
temple and what Solomon built. But at the same time, what I want you to do in the back of your mind is put yourself. As you're going through what Solomon has built and where Solomon has, has led the people because he, he created, he built the temple. God also built the temple. One thing I want to go to, I want to first point out is this place. This place. You look at this place around us, church. It doesn't matter what's going on outside. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. It doesn't matter what the weather is. But in this place, we have the opportunity to meet with God. It is a specific place. You say, well, I'm not quite understanding how that pertains to me. Where did God not want you to over your heart? Where did that relationship start? You know, they're saying the song about a religion. You know, the thing about it is, is religion's not going to get us out of here, church. Right. Religion is not going to get us out of here. And if you think it's religion, I'm sorry, it's not. Right. If you are putting efforts and effort and you are putting a lot of work into your religion, why don't you simply try a relationship? Get you a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And things have to change. It cannot stay the same. But it was specific. And if you look at verse 12, it said, and, uh, I have heard thy prayer, and I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. And if you go back and turn back with me to chapter 6 and verse 26, it says, When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, yet can they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them. There's something special about this place. It's a very specific place. There are a lot of places that it could be. There are a lot of places that it may look good to be. There are a lot of places that it may be fun to be. But those places were not, are not, and will not be this place. You're not going to find this place in the world. When, when Solomon built that temple, he, what he did is he took all that away from the world, set it aside, <clears throat> put it in a specific place in the this place. It was in that place, Dustin. Because the Solomon, if you go back and you remember the scriptures, David wanted to build a house to God. David wanted to build that temple. God told him no. This is not the time or the place. And I really truly believe that David did allow him to build. He wasn't built for Solomon. Did I don't believe that he, that he touched Solomon's heart different than he touched David's heart. Now, the Hebrew word for place is made up of four words. And uh, the root word means to rise. And it's kind of ironic if you look at it, if, uh, where we are in this place, this place is kind of lifted up from everything around it, isn't it? You, before you met Christ and before God knocked on you, the doors of your heart, what kind of, where were you? You were in a low place. Yeah. And if you wasn't, God bless you. Because <laughs> he pulled me up out of the mire. Hey. Set my feet up on a rock. Hey. And he lifted me up. Dusty. But you know what, church? It doesn't matter what somebody else thinks about how my relationship started with God. It doesn't matter what somebody else thinks of how my relationship is going with God. Because they cannot take away what he did for me. Right. They cannot take away what he does for me. Right. They cannot take away what he is to me, what he means to me, and what he does. He, he. How many of you guys had to think about taking a breath this morning when you got about to bed? How many of us had to think about taking a breath while we were asleep? How many of us even thought we were, oh, I've got it this morning, I didn't even know I was asleep. I knew Heather was asleep when I heard her. <laughs> but you know, we take all of these things for granted. God has gifted us beyond measure. Amen. In this place, He gave us this place. Church, He could have put us anywhere else. It wouldn't have been this place. And that word, I'm like saying, let me get back. It's made up of four words. It just means to rise. It's to, it's to rise. And it means a spot that's standing. And it can also be a condition of the body or the mind. I took it to me just like that. It's above every other thing. How do you feel about your house of God, church? How do 
How do we feel about our, uh, this place? How do we feel about our man of God that's in this place? How do we feel about the word that comes from comes forth from this place inside of this place? It's a specific place. But not only is there this place, there's this house. And this house is intentional. It, it is intentional. It's in verse, if you look at verse 16 again, um, I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Not only was it chosen, but it was cleaned up. But I'm going to tell you something, church. I, I didn't want to be around anybody after I was chosen, not until I got cleaned up. I knew that there was something God was doing in my heart. I knew that there was a change that God had called on me in my life to have made. But it, he cleaned me up. You know, when you knock someone on the door of your heart, you may not answer the first time. And if you did, then, then goodness, good grace, I'm going to tell you something. The rest of us, if you did, that is a blessing and a miracle in and of itself. All of the rest of us that we did not answer and we tried to run, it's only by the grace of God that he didn't turn us over to whatever lifestyle we were living in at the time he tried to get us to change. Yep. If you're sitting here now and you're saved and you, did, you didn't answer that call the first time, you're here by grace. Amen. And mercy applies. We all deserve hell. But it was intentional. When God knocked on your heart, David, he come to you. Whatever you were dealing with, he let that go, brother. Don't waste no more time, Marty, running that rabbit. Just let it go. You already talked to me about it. You come to me and you, 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 were, you were broken hearted and you said, Lord, what am I going to do? What he did, he showed you. Dustin, the things that he spoke to me, he's not going to say he wouldn't have spoken to you. He couldn't have because we were not, we were in the, we were heading to the same hell on the zip road. The reason that it was cleaned up was he was going to put his name on it. You think about that. My people, David Branch is one of my people. Roger Cook is one of my people. Ron Burchett is one of my people. You know, if you sit back and you think about that from the world perspective, man, that don't mean nothing. That don't mean nothing. It's because they don't know God. Right. Amen. Amen. It's because they don't know who God is. You know, we would be used to in the world, you want to get, get, get be involved with something. You want to put your name on something. Let somebody know this is mine. Put your name, write your name on it. I got one of these little things now that every time they get a chance to scribble their name on something, you're going to find out about two weeks later that it broke their name on it. Guess who was here? You don't have to guess. Her name's on there. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you, church, why can't we live our lives so that people are not saying, I, I, I know who they are. God's got his name all over their life. God's got his name all over their spirit. God's got his name on their actions, their words, their hearts, their desires. And that's why he cleaned us up, because he needed us to go out and share that. He needed us to be that that's going to spread that same word. And in uh, 1 Kings it says, And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built, to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. God is never going to leave us nor forsake us, church. Amen. Amen. If this body is the temple where the Holy Ghost dwells, he's going to be there. And he's telling us that he's going to be there forever. He's telling us he's not going to leave us. And you can tell it's intentional because it became personal. Look also in verse 16. For mine eyes, there in the latter half it said, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. He's going to pick us up and clean us up, brother, but he's not going to leave us. He's going to stay there with us. He's going to be right there walking beside of us. Right. Right. He's going to walk with us. And, oh, my goodness, I, I wish I 
wish I can't I cannot get it. I wish I could get you to, to hear what I'm feeling. I wish I could just be able to just take what God has, has laid on my heart and I can put it in the words. But sometimes church, I, it, it how oh. bless them all. Oh.
But I think what it is that God is really looking to do. He created a place and he set a house for this people. And that is something that's specific as well. And in verse 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. That word by my name, the Hebrew word, is pronounced shame. <laughs> and I got to thinking, I was convicted over that verse. There are some days where Brother James was talking about that Sunday school class. To my shame, I'm not standing in the manner that would be pleasing to God. Whether it's my thoughts, I don't, I don't, you know, don't get me wrong, church. I don't, I don't have to be doing something or saying something or something that's crazy, but my thoughts aren't good. My, my thoughts aren't automatically, you know. <laughs> I wake up in the morning and walk in the office and sit down in front of a computer. My boss calls and tells me that everything that he's told me to do for the past two weeks, I need to back up and start over. Well, thank you, sir. You know, I was hoping when I come in this morning, you were going to say something that backwards. Because my mood is just wonderful. God bless you, child. Since you be a citizen or angel. No, man, that ain't my heart. But I, <laughs> I heard somebody, what did I say? I'm going to have to set Jesus up here on the shelf for a minute. <laughs> now, think, now, listen, we can laugh, but I'm going to tell you something. The right day, at the right time, and the right situation, and the right person, we won't wait to set Jesus on the shelf. Before we know it, this flesh has rose up, and there's been a thought crossed our mind, and there may have been, listen, if we don't take that thought into captivity, we will continue to get further and further and further and further. That is why God is so concerned with this People, you church, this people. Oh my goodness! And it's the, and that word. Let me get back to that word. The definition is the, it's um, the, it's pronounced shame, and it's the idea of definite and conspicuous position. And that word conspicuous means standing out, has to be clearly visible. <coughs> Attracting notice or attention. Webster's 18.28 says that it's open to view, obvious to the eye, easy to be seen, and also obvious to the mental eye. Clearly or extensively known, perceived, or understood. That clearly visible and standing out. We come in here on Sundays and Wednesdays and during revivals and things of that nature, we're clearly busy. We look, rather, we look good, Brother Mike. from this people, what God wants from his people, is when we are viewed or scrutinized, if you will, it's clearly visible where we stand. I mean, you can come in, if you didn't visit here, you would be, it's clearly visible that Brother Willie and Miss Louise are man and wife. It's clearly visible. In my eyes, if I were to come in here and there was nobody else in here, Brother Will is probably, he's the quietest one. He's going to be the only one to be able to take. He can handle that. She's just 
Go at him and he's safe. Brother Willie's my role model. I have to tell you, I have not heard that part yet. <laughs> <laughs> but are we clearly, is it clearly visible, church? If we think about it from that perspective, well, let me just ask it this way. On any given day, if we're in a situation or a circumstance or just going about our day, and somebody's standing up on the hill watching, what is clearly visible to that person that's watching? If they were to walk away from that scenario, if they were to walk away from whatever was taking place, what would be clearly visible? Because now, we can, if, I'm, if I come out the front door and I'm leaving here tonight and somebody's watching, that part is clearly visible. But if I do something ridiculous coming out that door, that part's also clearly visible. But the thing about it is there had to be a thought to generate that action. And then there's a mental picture that's clearly visible as well. Why would preacher why? You know, the world is just upside down and you, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. Tell you what, I'll give you my cell phone and my computer in about 45 minutes, and I'll guarantee you every single person in every situation you deal with, you will have contact with <laughs> inside of that time frame. Everyone that pushes your buttons. Young people, why do you fight the things in your mind? Ladies, you guys are standing up here singing about the goodness of God. Satan does not like that. And if he can rob you of your song, he can change your heart. Yeah. If he can rob you of that song, because the Bible tells us to put a song in our heart, and if he can take it, he can affect your hearts. So young people, you keep singing. Amen. You keep singing. You don't stop singing. Some of the darkest days that I ever had the only thing that I had, Dustin, was a song. The only thing I had. I had the shortest prayer in the Bible and a song. Lord, save me. And I remember a lot of times I was singing, Precious Lord, take my hand. Leave me alone, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night,
You're not going to feel like walking. You're not going to feel like praising God. You're not going to feel like being happy, Bruce. You're not going to feel it, but you can always stand on the promise. You can always keep that song in your heart. Young ladies, young men, do not let the devil steal your song. That goes for us too, church. A lot of times you... i tell you what, I can tell you this. If you have a song in your heart that has struck a chord in your soul, you don't have to know what you're singing about. But if you sing it long enough, God's going to turn some lights on you. Amen. God's going to open some doors. The Bible says, any man lack wisdom, let him ask. Sometimes there's a lot of questions put forth in a song. In Psalms 24, 3 through 6, Who shall ascend? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul in the vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Salah. It's not a pleasant place to be, church, honestly. But don't you feel when you're fighting those things and God lays a song on your heart or sends you a scripture, it just, it's like it's pulled you out of all of it. I mean, it's just like it's done set you off on another planet that you don't even you don't even recognize what's going on down here most times. Now it might be because you're on the headline news or something and looking at some of this political stuff. I think I don't really don't think anybody can keep up with that. But God is not the author of confused. Right? Uh, amen, God. Amen. And if you're confused, let it go. There's no God in it. There is no God in it. God is calling us to stand up in this day and to proclaim his glory and his righteousness. It's not about us. It's all about him. Amen. The world that we're in is trying to convince us that it's all about man. It's not about man. It's about God. First wow. Peter says, so the, okay, First Peter 5 and 6, you want to know how do we get out of this? What do we do? How do we continue? Bloom where you're planted. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I believe, church, if you look at that and take that scripture, you say, well, what does that mean? Brother David, I believe you said, if you, just, if you sit still right now, I'm cleaning you up. Just sit right there, Brother Mike. There's a couple of spots that I've not gotten cleaned off yet, but if you'll sit right there, when you get up and I get done, Nobody have a question about where you've been or what you've been doing or who you've been because that person that is a new creature. Well, Brother Mike, why don't you do what the people? Remember, we used to do this. Most of the time, the ones that ask me that are the ones that still do it. Isaiah 59 and 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against them. There's a flag. That standard is just a banner. You know why we're feeling the attack that we're feeling from the world? Bruce, God has taken his banner, and everywhere you go, he is set right there. They're trying to get <coughs> you. They're coming at you hard. And just when they get right up to the point that you think, oh, here we go. They got to back off. The question is, is are we going to stand firm and trust God? This people, we the people, we are the people, we are God's people. You want to know why we're being attacked like we are? Because we are the last line in the fence. The world needs to get the church out of the way so that they are not going to be convicted by the wrongs that they're doing. The world is wanting to take right and make it wrong so that they can continue in the wrong and calling it right. And it's been that way. All through time. You tell me how this book right here 
can go through the things that it has gone through unchanged. There's people died for this word, church. There's people have died for hiding this word so that they could pass it on. And most of us have more than one copy. Most of us have more than two or three copies. We're not to stand themselves. We're not able to stand themselves. We must be fully aware that the fight that we are engaging in is being fought under the standard that God has raised, and it will be through His power, by His might, and on His timing. There's nothing that we can do other than stand where He has told us to stand in the manner in which He has presented for us to do so. We can walk outside of that. We've all walked outside of that, and we have determined walking outside of that, this is not where I want to be. Heather and me have said many, many times, and we look back on some of the things that people were in, some of the stuff that we were doing, and you know, we were having a ball. I mean, we really thought we were having fun. Once we had our eyes open, we said, wretched and miserable and do it not. We were miserable, church. We were absolutely miserable. But God commended his love toward us. Family fathers established this country upon the word of God. It was not founded on a woman that they may have had. It was not the person. It was the profession that God was in control. There's a quote by Thomas Jefferson. God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? that they are not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Where are we today, church? Stand strong. I encourage you to stand on that word of God. When you look in at 2 Chronicles, in the, in, the, in the text verse here, chapter 7, the temple's been dedicated to Solomon built for God's will. In verse 16, that word house, this house, the root word is family. No, they mean the root word is family. The root word is to build. The word means family. And the root word means to build. What's he doing with this, church? God has built us up for such a time as this. Where we are right now, God saw beyond the veil of time that we were going to be sitting in this place on this day. And I believe that when God, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, I believe, Brother Mike, I really truly do. I believe when, and can't nobody convince me otherwise. I believe when he said there now, and we talked about this in Sunday school, but think about it. If you really truly have a burden, and something is really burdening on your heart, and you kneel down to pray, you think about that person. Then you think about that person that's involved with that person. You think about the situation that that person's going through, Miss Shelby. You think about the people that could help them that may not have the means. You think about the people that have the means but don't have the inclination or the desire or that thing to prompt them to step up. And before you know it, you've got all of these people and these situations and these burdens and all of these situations, circumstances on your head, on your in your mind and on, on your, in your head, and it's just... He saw you, Terry. I believe Jesus Christ saw every single one of us when he was at the Garden of Gethsemane. Brother Ron, he knew what you were going to face. Miss Becky, he knew the trials that you were coming through. And he knew, just hold on. Mikey, he saw you. He said, Mikey, just lift up your head. Don't quit. Cameron, you stay in there. He knew what you were going to be facing. And he knew that those little simple things that Satan will throw out in your path could trip you up. Just look. Just be smart. Don't let them fool you, girls. Don't let them misconstrue the truth. And I can see him praying. Dustin, I can just see him down there praying. Oh, my gosh, Lord. Wow, please. I believe so. I believe that with all my heart, man. I believe he knew the things that I was going to come involved with, that I was going to get involved with, that I was going to come in contact. 
Luke 6 and 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. You are his people. We the people. We've been given a position. We've been given an elevated position. We've been given a status. We've been given a job. Not like what the world thinks of hope, church. Not like the way the world sees hope as something that just might happen. Well, I, mean, I, hope I, I, hope I, I hope I can do this. I hope no. No, 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 no. That blessed assurance. It's not just something that you hope for. It's, it's going to happen. Hosea 4 and 6. The answer is if we the people stay silent. What is the price of love that they pay? Then Hosea 4 and 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We talk in Sunday school all the time. Every single person sitting in this building tonight, every single person that may be watching, every single person that may watch later, you will be able to come in contact that no other person in the world will be able to contact and reach the way you do. Mr. Terry, there are people that you'll come in contact with, I'll never see. And if I see them, I won't get a chance to speak to them the way you do. There's an opportunity for their church, for God's people, to invite more of God's people. Satan knows our pride. And if he thought we would have to give him credit for it, that pride, that, that pride would cause us to rebel against even God. That pride, if we have to give somebody else credit for anything, it pains us sometimes, church, if we're honest. We want to be the one taking credit for something. We want to be, it's me, me, me. Eve, even in the garden, he convinced Eve that she wanted what it was that he was after. He twisted the truth on Eve. And where we are now, we've got Satan again twisting the truth. The Bible says even the very left will be called the apostle. That's not us, church. He's wrong. <laughs> Same lie 